Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center 2021 Spring ADRC meeting. I'm excited to kick off today's biomarker session with Jeff Dage, who is from Lilly, who is also working with Nick Rad on setting up a biomarker lab. Um, welcome, Jeff, and feel free to start sharing whenever you're ready. Oh, thank you, Hannah. You know, thank you for uh, the opportunity to update the Alzheimer's Disease Research Centers on the progress uh, towards establishing a blood biomarker capability lab, um, which will support uh, studies banked at NICRAD. The mission of the laboratory is to provide reliable and consistent research biomarker results that can be compared through time and across studies to facilitate research on the etiology, early detection, and therapeutic development for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Our immediate goals are setting up the lab and implementation of robust assays with broad applicability across all studies. The assays that have reached this level of understanding are neurofilament light, phosphorylated tau, and A-beta peptides 1 to 40 and 1 to 42. We're also watching the field and we're interested to hear from all of you on as far as input on other assays that researchers believe have similar broad utility or research interests. So why establish this lab at Indiana University? The, the integration with NICRAD will enable an integrated and efficient process for analysis and result return. Even studies without a biomarker focus can partner with NICRAD to include the core biomarkers with standard collection methodology and minimal effort. A strategic focus on core biomarker assays can allow for longitudinal quality monitoring and consistent delivery of results over time, as well as opportunities for cross-lab comparability studies. Now, there are many issues that slow implementation and learning from biomarkers. And it will be the intention of the lab at Indiana University to participate and help facilitate research across these issues. With our focus on reliable and consistent results, we hope to help accelerate the learning possible with these novel biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease and related dimensions. Now I have a few examples of these biomarkers from very large studies. This study using 3,762 samples available from uh, ADNI, they measured uh, phosphorylated PAL-181 at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. This took 47 analytical runs and they monitored, monitored variability across the study. It is evident from this example that large studies can be completed in laboratories with robust attention to quality and results can provide evidence for biomarker utility. In a similar study by the same laboratory at the University of Gothenburg, neurofilament light results can be obtained with similar quality performance characteristics. Both examples illustrate potential when robust quality procedures are in place. The third study illustrates again, the use of both individual and this time multiplex formats at large scale. And again, at a quality focused laboratory. These approaches can lead to interesting comparisons and combinations of biomarkers leading to further understanding of their utility. In this case, 5,094 samples from the Rotterdam study were analyzed in the Quanteryx Accelerator Laboratory and quality criteria were established such that only 4,444 results were reported and included in the analysis. Again, illustrating the scalability of these assays, but also the warning that 10 to 12% of the samples may not generate results of sufficient quality and consistent procedures need to be in place prior to sample analysis. And, and this will help identify inappropriately handle results. And this is important for longitudinal tracking across studies as well. So the final example I have is uh, one that was just recently published uh, by C2N. And it's highlighting the use of immunoprecipitation mass spectrometry methods to measure A-beta peptides. Here they're using their high precision and quality methods to explore levels across six different cohorts. And it's clear there's a cohort effect that complicates the interpretation of the utility of the biomarker. As a result of the quality of the assay methodology, 
the focus can be placed on cohort differences or pre-analytical sample handling differences to explain cohort effects as opposed to laboratory biases or laboratory drift. This illustrates the importance of maintaining reliable and consistent results over time and across studies. So there are multiple P-tau assays. Um, you know, I, I talk about phosphorylated tau, um, but there's multiple isoforms, there's multiple different uh, assays. Each assay is, is made up of two different antibodies and there's a lot of different combinations. And, and one of those is the phosphorylated tau 217 assay from Lilly, where I come from. Um, and, and right now it's not commercially available. Our focus of our laboratory is gonna be on commercially available assays because we wanna we want to pick assays that are going to be out there. They're going to be reliable and robust and, and people have access, uh, access to them for learning. Um, and so what we're working with is uh, with, with Tatiana at IU, we're working with people, myself at Lilly, to try and put together a process, a simple process um, to enable study review. And based on that review, um, uh, if Lilly agrees to run the samples, um, then we'll have a very efficient process for um, finishing the contracting, getting the samples in, returning results, and, and making that process uh, uh, uniform and consistent. And so if, if studies are interested um, in banking at NICRAD and, and having access to the 217 assay, at least there's a mechanism that, by which we can request uh, the, the Lilly 217 data now um, before maybe it is commercially available. And hopefully down the road, it will be commercially available. Um, but right now, the focus of the lab is gonna be to implement commercially available assays. Um, and so we wanted to acknowledge that we're trying to put something in place um, because this is a question that comes up and we're trying to make it standardized and efficient to kind of make the whole process easier to get through. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So there's, a, there's this, this is a pretty detailed slide and this is, you can look at this at your leisure. This is the, just the basic set of information. So when I say a Lilly, Eli Lilly review, you know, what information do you have to provide in your study? It's really about this information. It's not a lot. Uh, it doesn't have to be overly detailed or anything like that. It's pretty basic information just to allow us to understand the scientific purpose of the study and, and the number of samples and when you expect data and whatnot. So we can go to the next slide. So, oh yeah, the, the plasma reference pools. So um, I think this is really, really important. So. There's, there's uh, something that NICRAD uh, really brings to the table here with, with uh, blood biomarkers. And they've, they've had this procedure that they've been utilizing for making plasma reference pools. So they can pool residual aliquots or materials and create reference pools, so multiple aliquots from these different samples. And then they can implement those or, or insert, insert those within the study uh, that you're doing and have it kind of, kind of like a, a quality control uh, samples that are run uh, throughout the study and even across studies to kind of gauge how things are performing and even to the extent that they can be used to track um, batch effects or laboratory effects. And, and they may be use, used um, to kind of uh, calibrate or, or uh, um, uh, adjust studies in order to merge them together with the highest level of quality. And so, so this is really a unique aspect of uh, something that Nick Red brings to the table and how they bank in the, in the level of quality and some of the procedures they have as far as reference pools. So we can go to the next slide. So time, timeline. So uh, this is really just a high level timeline. Um, it, we're, we're currently in the process of getting the equipment, getting the lab set up, putting pro, uh, all of our procedures, documenting all of our procedures and uh, putting those all in place. Uh, getting staffing set up. And then 2022, we're going to be all set up. Hopefully we'll get that assays validated in 2021. Um, and we'll be to the point in 2022 where, where we'll be processing bank samples. And we plan to have an initial capacity of up to about 10,000 samples per year, but it'll be implemented in a way that's scalable as demand and funding determined. And so I, I think this generally gives you the idea of where we are and where we're going. So I think we can go to the next slide. And, and here I'm gonna hand it back over to Tatiana to wrap it up here. So, so I'll, I'll take it back and try to give a little bit of context now around how this fits in with other NIA initiatives, um, both within the Alzheimer's centers and also in other NIA funded projects. So I, I think I just wanna pair this whole question about plasma with DNA. And I had talked about this at the NIA AD Summit. And I, I guess I wanna restate it once more. 
It's a logical thing to be thinking about combining the collection of a blood tube, um, particularly EDTA, and thinking about DNA and plasma. And part of what I'm trying to get people thinking about is how can we really be advancing both of those areas? So I think when you want to be using and developing plasma biomarkers, you want to have that sample also associated with genetic data. It's going to increase the value of that plasma, the plasma biomarkers you're going to do, and it just really lifts all the boats that we have ongoing um, at NIA. And so again, this idea that you can ensure sample collection, um, and I want to encourage in particular that we be trying to implement, yes, I think all the um, ADRCs have a, have a blood collection protocol, but we're also trying to encourage studies that are perhaps affiliated with Alzheimer's centers or perhaps others that you're aware of. So I'm trying to basically pitch this as broadly as I can, that we're trying to ensure that there's banking of diverse and representative individuals and populations. Um, this is a challenge that we have, um, with NIH funded studies that we really don't reflect diversity as well as we'd like to. I'd like to really encourage that when collecting a plasma sample, getting DNA gives you a way to get GWAS, for example, and having GWAS on basically all collected DNA samples gives us incredible advantages in terms of analysis. It allows you to, collect, to obtain polygenic risk scores, correct for ancestry. And again, um, we're trying to really think about this as a broader initiative. How can we coordinate biomarker assays and make it easier to combine samples across Alzheimer's centers and across studies? And that's partly what I'm transitioning us to now in terms of opportunities. So I want to say a little bit more about diversity. And again, I think this is a sort of an obvious slide. The majority, the vast majority of individuals with samples banked at NICRAD are white non-Hispanic individuals. And it's a priority of NIH. It's a priority of so much in terms of health-related um, inequities and really ensuring diversity in our research participants that we're trying to really expand the, the range of individuals involved with research. And when there is research and they're involved in research, making sure that we're collecting biological samples. So I think that really leads to how do you, how do you make sure that this can be done given that many of the studies that are recruiting more diverse individuals maybe doing them in settings that don't bring individuals into academic healthcare centers. So I think the first part is really improving our ability to describe why biomarker research, why genetic research is important, why individuals, um, why this is important for individuals to participate in, what's the value, what can be learned. So I think that's sort of a broader initiative that I just wanna make sure I pair with this. I think we also wanna make it again easier for individuals to participate in research. And when you think about a blood draw, one of the things that I most frequently hear from studies that aren't currently collecting a blood sample that don't have a phlebotomist, how would I be able to collect that sample in the community? And I think one of the things COVID has given us the opportunity for is to partner actually with companies, many of them national, that are able to collect samples either in an individual's home or could come, for example, to a community center. And we'd be able to simplify and ease that burden for studies that aren't sure how to be able to collect those samples. So I wanted to say that here and say that certainly at NICRAD and a number of other studies, we are glad to partner with you and help you um, link up with these resources. So what's the opportunity sort of with collaboration here? And I think we've alluded to that. So um, we anticipate that we'll be able to start running assays with this new laboratory in 2022. We are really eager in NICRAD to be able to partner with investigators working with cohorts that are either not including sample collection or don't have a plan to collect plasma in particular. Um, we're again, as I've, I've sort of alluded to here over and over again, really interested in trying to engage cohorts that might be thinking about or are involving participants that are diverse. This is something that's incredibly important in the field. So um, I just really want to open it up to questions. I, I, I want to make sure I leave this slide up for a little bit of time. Um, we are recruiting, and I think many of us are shamelessly um, going to be doing this throughout the Alzheimer's Center's meetings. We do have a position open. It's a faculty position at IU. Um, that would be um, involved in leading this laboratory on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I've got more information. I've got the posting right there, and I would be glad to talk to individuals who might like to know more about this. And so I thought I would stop sharing my screen, and, and Jeff and I did this deliberately. We tried to leave ourselves some time that we could answer immediate questions if there were any, um, rather than having you wait till 1.30, um, but wanted to really be able to engage all of you into questions. And I think we've got them in the chat, so let me... Um, uh, I'm just looking for the top. I've got a lot of chatter here. Um, uh, all right, so it says a longitudinal blood samples to identify the trajectory of biomarkers, especially among asymptomatic, will be critical. Tied to that is proposing an optimal time interval between blood sample draws to observe the change reliably. 
So we were hoping that this would be a question that would come up and wanted to be able to have some discussion around this. So given the data, um, we'd love to be able to have some discussion. I think this is a great group in which to have that, um, whether or not really um, running samples on, collect many of us are collecting samples annually, whether or not that's really the interval and where we're likely to really be able to observe change um, and also potentially within trajectory of, of early progression. So I'd love to open it up and encourage people to raise their hands and, and, and let us have kind of a broader discussion if we could. Donna? Hey, Tatiana. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really good question. And I just wanted to say we've been doing this um, in the biomarker core at the UK ADC for a couple of years now, and we've gone back to as far as our 2012 draws, um, looking at annual, you know, change and some participants now we have maybe eight annual blood draws where we've done the AD biomarkers, the cytokines, and it, it helped. There's a lot of, I, I not a lot, but there's some noise, right, year to year. And I think if you just had the two time points, you might make a different conclusion than having you know, the eight years of data where it might bounce around, but you see a downward trend over time or an upward trend over time. Um, we, Erin uh, Abner, who you know um, at, at UK, um, our biostatistician, you know, she is um, working through some of that data to look at one year versus five year change and, and see, but I will say just looking at a couple of time points, it's hard to distinguish noise from, from real change. Donna, I, I might also add, uh, if I could, um, in, in our clinical trial work, we, we tend to do higher density sample collections. Um, so over like 18 months, we'll have six or seven different collections. Uh, and and the, some of the biomarkers are more variable than others. And so a lot of it will depend on the biomarker, but yeah. uh, some of them are also pretty stable. Um, and, and it'll allow you to pick it up, pick up differences. So in some of our work, um, we, we are seeing in the preclinical and the transition to amyloid positivity uh, or in, you know, normal people in the transition to amyloid positivity or to symptomatic, um, you can start to pick up those differences. And, and, and because we do the high density, you can start to get an idea of um, sample size and power. And yeah. so all of this is really important. And, and having a mixture of studies with high density versus, versus longer, I think can help inform both things. Yeah, and I will say that, you know, you're right, some of them are very noisy, cytokines, incredibly noisy, you know, year to year, but uh, we've noticed especially PTAL 181 and, and NFL do seem to be a lot more stable as far as tracking, you know, change over time. Anyone else want to comment on that before I start to go to some of the questions we're starting to get in the, in the Q&A? Anyone else want to comment and add to that discussion before we, we go to the next item? All right, so I do have a question from Dave Morgan who asks about collection tubes. So um, we, and, and I think many other, other studies, samples we provide for plasma EDTA tubes is pretty standard in terms of plasma collection. Um, and again, um, that also allows us to get that buffy coat. Uh, Sterling um, asks about pre-analytical protocols. So we have um, manuals that we've got certainly at the NICRAD website. Glad to make sure that we get everybody um, aligned on that, make sure it's all outwardly facing. And so our goal is really to have that be as broadly available as possible. Many of you know, there's many initiatives that have been looking at pre-analytical variables. And so um, we're also consistent with what's being recommended um, from those studies as well. So Jeff, you've got a question about platforms that you're gonna be using to run um, assays. Do you wanna talk a little bit about platforms and your strategy? Yeah, I think it's there's 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 always a lot of choice, um, and I think that's a real challenge, um, and, and it's a challenge to the field. And so the strategy we're taking is to identify um, a platform that's uh, one a, a leading platform, commercially available with sufficient quality criteria or validation criteria. And so we're we're really trying not to pick always you know the best or the newest, um, the latest and greatest, but really the one that works reasonably well with good precision and is controllable. So it's robustly designed. And so that does kind of um, lead you in different directions. So in neural filament, I think we're really focused right now or our plans are around the Quanterix neural filament assay. Um, and, and also with uh, PTAL, uh, looking at the PTAL 181, we're looking at the Quanterix platform. Um, for A beta measures, there's, there's a lot of choice. Um, and we're currently evaluating which platform is going to be the balance between precision and robustness, uh, as well as uh, efficiency. 
um, because doing the both both uh, one to forty and to forty two, uh, it's it's uh, also about efficiency. Uh, let me go to the next question. So Li Wei Jin asks about um, makes a comment about Quest and sample collection. So I, I've managed to blank at this moment. So um, I know Kelly Favors out there. And so I'm going to ask Kelly Faber to type into the chat. We've had two companies um, in particular that have we worked with um, in terms of developing protocols, because one of the challenges with Quest is their ability to um, process the samples and not only collect them, but process them and then also freeze them. And that's been a challenge for them to be able to do that. So um, if you can, Kelly, just tuck that into the chat if you don't mind. Uh, there's a question. I'm just going to keep rolling through them. There's a question around um, logistics, Jeff. So you're getting a question asking why does each study need to go to a Lilly for their approval for PTAP 217? Why can't there just be a blanket agreement that would allow this to just be done for all studies? Yeah, so I you, wish want, we, you want to cover that? <laughs> yeah, I wish we had unlimited capacity. And, and really that's what it comes down to is just capacity. Um, every laboratory suffers um, with capacity problems and, um, and Lilly's no different. Um, we have a lot of ongoing clinical trials. We have a lot of ongoing research studies. Um, and then, you know, Lily uh, has a lot of work, collaborative work we do with different groups. You know, we publish quite a bit with uh, Mayo Clinic, UCSF, uh, Oscar Hansen, and, and different groups. Um, and in and, and, and all of those, you know, you're, you're talking uh, 20, 30, 40,000 samples a year. Um, it, we don't have unlimited capacity. And so the review really is about looking at the study, looking at how it fits into the, the current knowledge base. Uh, and, and then it gets kind of, thought of, it's not really prioritized, but it's thought of in the, in the context of novelty, uh, scientific advancement, things like that. And really it's more about priority. So, you know, Lily, Lily could probably say yes to a lot of studies if you don't mind your study being run in 10 years. Um, but, but usually people aren't happy with that. Um, so it's a balance of timeline and, and capacity and, and that's why. And then contractually, it's really a challenge um, to do individual studies uh, or, or do a, a bunch of studies in one group because every every study usually has different criteria. And so what we're gonna do, or we're gonna try and do is put that blanket agreement or overarching agreement in with uh, NICRAD, with Tatiana. And then um, each new study that comes into that blanket agreement is a simple project letter. And that should streamline things tremendously if, if we can achieve it. And so then the project letter really covers study specific details, numbers of samples and things like that. And, and it's really about efficiency. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going. We're getting great questions. Just Kelly Faber's um, answered in the chat for those of you or the Q&A for anyone's looking for um, my on-site healthcare and exam one, at least the two we've had some experience with. So I've got two more, Jeff, and I'm gonna see if there's more, just keep sending them in. Um, next one, and, I, and we may both have to address it, but I'll let you start, Jeff, is around, um, is NICRAD evaluating interest subject reliability? for each target plasma biomarker, wondering about diurnal, physiological, test assay processing variability, and especially sticky peptides, um, EGA beta. So that comes from Lee Goldstein. Do you wanna start with that one, Jeff? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely important. So, you know, usually in, in, the, in the pharma companies, we do that uh, quite often, especially in our phase one studies, we'll do a lot of those uh, diurnal rhythm studies and things like that when we're focused, especially in CSF. Um, and and um, we also do it in all of our phase one studies because we're always doing pharmacokinetics. And so we have a really detailed time course. Uh, and so we can, we can do matching uh, pharmacodynamic measures at the time. But in, in, this, in the research studies, we're limited by um, your sample collection. And so if your study design is, uh, is designed to look at that, absolutely, we'll be, we'll be very interested in doing it. Um, we'll probably have some of our own um, maybe we'll have some grow if we can uh, uh, get access to samples and subjects um, to look at some of those things to kind of characterize and provide a rough guidance for people. So, what, you know, how much do they change over, over time? How much, you know, in a week or two weeks or three months, things like that. Some basic things to give you some idea of how to power a study to look at some kind of change. So we will do a little bit. And historically there's been, um, for some studies, not all collection of time, you know, when, um, when samples are being collected. I will say, I think it's challenging, for example, in many studies to try to always have people at a certain time of day. I think that that has proven to be particularly challenging. Yeah. We've got another question. I think it's from Sandy Weintraub. So she is asking about capacity and I'll, I'll start it, Jeff, and then I'll let it go to you. The issue of capacity is critical because what is the envisioned turnaround time once samples are submitted? And so I think this is probably a good question around strategy. And I think it's a great question for the group. 
So this is not designed to be, um, for example, a clinical results where you're going to be acting upon that. So I want to start to maybe frame this and remind everyone um, just for the, for the purposes of what we're doing. This is around research results. I think the other question is around how these data are going to be used. For a number of studies, they're, going to, they're not going to be analyzing these one at a time. They're typically going to want to have groups of samples to be done together. So I think that's certainly the context in which I think return of data is probably the most logical. As many studies, not all, and this is where part of that discussion will occur with studies, many studies will say they'll want to have like an interim analysis, you know, perhaps after two to three years of collection, they'll want to run a large number of samples, and then again at the end. Um, there will be some studies where running them, you know, frequently um, while we're doing other runs will make sense. But I think it really, um, even though you, you obviously correct, you know, we're doing everything we can in terms of correcting for batch effects. I think you also want to think about the logic of how that study is actually going to use that data. And I don't know if you want to add to that, Jeff. So I, I've actually dodged the question around um, the turnaround time because I think we're just waiting to see how much, you know, how much the volume turns out to be. We're building right now for 10,000 and trying to see, you know, where that where that's going to go. And so, you know, are you all going to contact us or how this will work? Do you want to mm -hmm. add to that, Jeff? I'll just say that, you know, um, I'm, I'm a big believer in telling you uh, when I'm going to run them and then trying to trying to deliver. Um, so so it's going to depend. So, you know, if, if I tell you it's going to be turned around in 30 days, uh, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and, 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 and I can do that because I can keep an eye on studies and, and how they're coming in when they're scheduled and things like that. So so it's really about making a commitment to you when you do bring your study to us. Of, of when you want the one, one is when you need the results. And then how does that slot into what we can deliver? And, and, and it'll be something that's very manageable to predict. And so it, will it be always within a day? You know, we won't be that, that good, but uh, it'll certainly be ballpark uh, delivery on time uh, to commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I would say, I think if this is similar to, for example, how we handle it, and the way I, I guess I largely envisioned it is, you know, currently we do turnaround of data frequently. It's quarterly, um, you know, depending on the type of data, as, as many of you know, like GWAS data gets returned largely annually. And so I think partly this is also looking at the time frame of how people are going to be analyzing it. All right, I'm going to take one more question and then I'll turn it over to, the, to Donna, who's going to be the next speaker. Um, uh, we've got a question about from um, Sanjay Stan about, uh, about collecting blood in heparin tubes. And if this and if the data would be uh, reliable, do you want to start with that, Jeff? Uh, that's going to depend on every assay. Um, yep. You know, we 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 we're going to validate these for K two EDTA, uh, kind of like that's that's what the field has been looking at the most. Uh, that's what we've done the most. Um, we will probably do some tube type uh, evaluations so that we have an idea on the effects of tube type to different assays as part of our validation. Um, but, but I can't commit if heparin's good for all the assays. We know, we know it's not. Uh, it, it does change the levels. Um, but, it, but if you do your complete study in one tube type, will you get actionable data? We, 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 you know, we can probably give, give an idea of that. Okay. And, and I lied, Don. I'm doing one last one because I think it would be relevant. So someone's just asked about, would centers like to use the data for ATN characterization during the research diagnosis process? And they're worried about annual batches. I think that's why Jeff and I are both trying to understand how people would like to use data. And if it is going to be like a study where they want to analyze everything, like a, a midpoint and final analysis. And I think we'd like to understand how people plan to use that. And if it is on more of a short term basis. So we would love to talk to people afterward. Um, you know, we can do this again. We can continue this at 1.30 or in another setting. We're really trying to understand this better. So I want to thank everyone. We're back at 1.30, all of us to take questions. And, and so thank you all very much. Okay, uh, so thanks, <clears throat> Tatiana. Um, I am pleased to uh, share an update on Mark VCID today. So, uh, Mark VCID uh, is uh, NINDS, uh, an NIA funded biomarker consortium uh, aiming to identify uh, biomarkers for small vessel disease and vascular cognitive impairment. I don't have any disclosures. And just um, up front, uh, this is our team. Uh, we have been working together for close to five years now um, on Mark VCID. And I am uh, presenting on behalf of the whole team uh, today and uh, gonna try and give you a, uh, an overall update on where all of the Mark VCID kits uh, are sitting right now. Um, they look, uh, they're making progress. So 
We have published um, our, our protocols uh, in two separate uh, publications um, that came out earlier this year, well, at the end of last year, actually online. So, um, so they were both in Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, back to back, one talking about enrollment, clinical and fluid protocols, and then uh, the other talking about the neuroimaging protocols. So uh, they're available online for you. If uh, anyone has any problems, they can, uh, I'm happy to send PDFs. So these are the uh, kits that we have been working to validate uh, within the consortium. Um, and just to refresh everyone's memory with respect to this consortium, the goal is to uh, not only identify potential biomarkers for small vessel disease, but to validate these biomarkers across the consortium sites uh, and determine how uh, reproducible they're going to be. Uh, so in, in, uh, in all cases for the kits, we talk about two different validation types. We talk about instrumental validation. So this is looking at the reproducibility of the data for that kit across the consortium sites. And then we talk about the biological validation, which is going to be uh, the testing of the primary hypothesis across sites and, and across uh, the different cohorts. So we have both imaging kits and fluid kits. Um, hopefully, uh, I'm going to try and pull my laser pointer up here. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to preface uh, my discussion of the imaging kits with I am not an imager. And so my, um, I understand the kits, but uh, the, the physics of the kits uh, is beyond, beyond me. Uh, hopefully there's uh, other members of the consortium if people have questions around that. So we look at free water, white matter, hyperintensity, cerebrovascular reactivity, arteriosclerosis measures, uh, and um, I'm going to talk about each of these kits, the growth and regression of white matter hyperintensities. And then we also have a, a retinal uh, angiography um, imaging. Uh, this is the OCTA kit. And then on the fluid side, we have several kits. So the plasma endothelial signaling kit, uh, we have a endothelial derived exosome uh, endothelial inflammation kit. Uh, we have plasma NFL and then a CSF uh, placental growth factor. So I'm gonna talk about each of these um, in brief detail, if there's specific questions, uh, we can address those. So first kit I wanna talk about is the free water kit. And this is from uh, Drs. Mayard and uh, Caprihan, uh, a collaboration between UC Davis and New Mexico. So the hypothesis that's being tested with this kit is that free water will be associated with executive function composite scores. Um, all of the sites within Mark VCID have agreed to participate. Um, between legacy cohorts as well as prospective cohorts, there are 13 cohorts being uh, evaluated. So um, each site is generating uh, the measures and computing this uh, composite executive score uh, and then looking at this. So the hope is that that biologic validation uh, that I talked about uh, will be complete uh, very soon. Uh, but with respect to instrumental validation, uh, there is outstanding um, cross-site uh, reliability. So. Uh, we have uh, inter-rater reliability shown here. You can see that the ICC is uh, 0.997. Um, with respect to test-retest reliability, so we had uh, participants um, at, at sites, uh, approximately uh, 20 participants at each site uh, would come in um, for a second MRI scan a week after the initial uh, and we would look at the test retest. You can see that that uh, ICC was uh, significant too. And uh, the inter-scanner reproducibility. So uh, looking at uh, different images, you can see uh, different uh, MRI machines, sorry. Uh, you can see we still maintained a strong ICC. So the DTI uh, free water uh, is moving along. The uh, white matter hyperintensity kit by Charlie DeCarli at UC Davis. Um, this kit uh, hypothesizes that white matter hyperintensities will associate with uh, measures of processing speed and specifically looking at trails uh, A and B and um, IRT specific executive function. Um, this is, the goal of this biomarker is to stratify individuals and enrich uh, study populations for vascular disease. And um, 
uh, again, uh, the goal is going to be to uh, select subjects who have vascular disease. So uh, this is the process of the kit. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, it's uh, a, a flare image um, and uh, uh, the, the kit uh, from Charlie has, uh, has been uh, somewhat automated and um, I know uh, the sites have been very happy with the data output here. If you look at the cross-site uh, reliability on this, uh, again, uh, very, uh, very good cross-site. Uh, um, uh, cross-site uh, reliability on the white matter hyperintensity measure. And uh, this is, I think, the only kit at this point that we have some biologic validation on. Um, you can see uh, that uh, there is an association both with executive score and uh, with, with memory score. And uh, thanks to uh, Charlie for providing this data and uh, letting me show this today. So uh, the WMH kit is um, considered uh, you know, validated at this point. Um, the cerebrovascular reactivity kit from Han Zhang Lu. Uh, this, um, this kit has been uh, moving along very well. It's still uh, somewhat in the validation stages. Uh, this has been the hardest one to get participants to, uh, to restart uh, post COVID. So we are bringing participants in for imaging um, now regularly. Uh, but our participants, because of the breathing tubes and the, and the CO2, are still somewhat reluctant to uh, participate in this. And that's something that I think a lot of our sites are working on. So um, the cerebrovascular reactivity uh, is a 70 second room air breathing block um, interleaved with 50 second CO2 breathing blocks. Uh, and it's a bold MRI sequence. Um, you can see here that if you look at the bold signal between normal um, and impaired, you have a, a decreased signal indicating a, a decreased cerebrovascular reactivity in response to that CO2. Uh, and the data uh, from Hanzang's group suggests that um, as uh, CVR, uh, goes down, so too does the MOCA score. Um, and you can see that this is a statistically significant uh, relationship there. So, uh, so this kit, again, um, this kit is continuing uh, its validation. Uh, this is an arteriosclerosis kit. Uh, this is uh, led by Konstantinos Hofanakis um, of the Illinois Institute of Technology and, and also Rush University. And this uh, is a uh, this was uh, generated interestingly from uh, the Rush Group's uh, uh, postmortem MRI imaging uh, program, and so uh, using uh, DICOM files of MPRAGE, Flare, and DTI, uh, this gets imputed, and uh, at the output is a arteriosclerosis score which gives uh, the likelihood of that individual having um, arteriolosclerosis pathology. Um, the instrumental validation is complete. So you can see the interrater, the test retest, and the inter-scan reproducibility have all been uh, significantly high with uh, 0.99 ICCs. And um, there has been some testing, again, outside of Mark VCID uh, within uh, the cohorts we're familiar with at Rush, uh, the MAPROS and the MARS cohorts. Um, what you see here is um, with increasing um, arteriolosclerosis uh, pathology, there is an increased uh, arteriolosclerosis score, and uh, this seems to be a nice stepwise relationship. So instrumental validation is complete. Uh, biological validation is ongoing at this point. Um, the peak skeletonized mean diffusivity, or PSMD, this is led by Claudia uh, Satizabal uh, Barrera out of uh, San Antonio uh, and also leverages a lot of the charge uh, cohort. Uh, so this kit um, proposes the hypothesis that higher uh, PSMD will be associated with poorer uh, general cognitive function. And again, the goal with this kit is that uh, it can be used for risk stratification uh, for inclusion in small vessel disease. So 
what you uh, what you can see here, and uh, this is a, re a reference from the group uh, that. Uh, PSMD provides a mean diffusivity dispersion um, in the in the white matter skeleton, and higher PSMD values do uh, indicate greater white matter microstructural damage. Um, and this is a fully automated uh, biomarker kit. And so uh, again, uh, the imaging kits have been performing uh, really exceptionally well when it comes to cross-site validation. So. Uh, the instrumental validation, we have uh, inter-rater, we have test-retest, and we have inter-scanner. Reproducibility with ICCs all running um, around the, the 0.9, um, you can see the lowest is 0.92 here, for, and that's the inter-site reproducibility. So um, this has passed the uh, instrumental validation and is now moving to biologic. Um, the uh, white matter hyperintensity growth and regression kit, uh, this is led by uh, Ahmed Barani, um, along with Greg Jiker and Brian Gold at the University of Kentucky. And uh, here the, the uh, hypothesis is that uh, the growth in white matter hyperintensities uh, over time will correlate with uh, wordless delayed free recall um, z-scores. And the goal of this kit is actually to track disease progression uh, for small vessel disease. Um, and, uh, and the use will be to isolate growth and regression as unique variables, um, depending on uh, proposed mechanisms of action. And so uh, with this, then um, we have uh, completed the instrumental validation. Uh, what we have done here, you can see across sites, um, looking at, in this case, looking at the growth of white matter hyperintensities uh, over time, uh, you can see that uh, using the kit, uh, the sites have been able to achieve uh, very good, uh, very strong cross-site uh, reliability in assessing uh, white matter hyperintensity growth. And similarly, um, you can see that with, uh, with white matter hyperintensity regression now, uh, we've been able to quantify that regression across sites with excellent um, reliability and, and, and very high um, ICCs generally. So uh, because this kit requires longitudinal imaging, so at least two time points, um, many sites uh, because of COVID have not been able to complete their one year follow-up visits yet. Uh, we have done a reasonable number at UK, but we haven't um, been able to get everybody back in yet. So this kit is going to take some time for biological validation just because of the nature of uh, the longitudinal nature of, of the kit. And then um, the OCTA from Amir Kashani at USC, uh, this uh, kit uh, uh, tests the hypothesis that the odds of cognitive impairment corresponding to retinal vessel skeleton density, VSD. Um, uh, and so uh, the primary outcome here is going to be uh, impairment based on MOCA score. Um, and the, the ideal uh, use of this is to enrich individuals with significant, uh, sorry, enrich cohorts and, and enrollment with, uh, for individuals with significant uh, cerebral small vessel disease contributing to their, their, their cognitive impairment and dementia. And so this is uh, the OCTA um, instrument. Uh, here you see the, uh, the angiography uh, measure. Uh, and so this is a FDA approved device. Um, and uh, Amir has been very busy training um, technicians at the various Mark VCID sites that are participating. Um, and inter-rater reliability um, is assessed on common uh, data sets across each site. Uh, and then they have been uh, performing a test retest on this OCTA. Um, and this has been anywhere from one to 14 days. So um, uh, they have uh, published this protocol and this is just some uh, data from Amir showing uh, that uh, with increased uh, VSD, uh, obviously higher MOCA scores. So as that density goes down, so too does the MOCA. Um, and uh, you can see a similar relationship over here. 
Um, the next uh, kit is the Plasma NFL kit, again from uh, Claudia Sertizabal Barrera uh, at San Antonio in charge. Um, so uh, I think a lot of us are very familiar with NFL. Uh, the hypothesis here is that ele elevated uh, concentrations of NFL in the blood will be related to lower cognitive function. Um, this is, uh, the goal is uh, risk stratification for inclusion in BCID trials. Uh, and of course, this is uh, being measured using the Samoa assays. Um, uh, as we know, uh, a lot of us uh, appreciate then that axonal injury in the brain, uh, NFL is released and NFL uh, then crosses the blood brain barrier and we can measure it uh, in the blood. And, um, and uh, so with respect to that, uh, we know that blood and CSF NFL uh, concentrations do actually correlate quite strongly. Uh, with respect to the reproducibility across sites, um, what you see is inter-site reproducibility, uh, again, running in that 0 .9, uh, 0 0.99 ICCs across the three sites, UK, uh, San Antonio, and uh, University of Vermont. Uh, this is uh, looking at uh, test-retest reliability, so bringing participants in for a second blood draw one week, and then also two weeks later, um, you can see that there's a minimal variability over time in the NFL. Uh, and this address uh, a question previously that Tatiana um, received. And then we did compare the single NFL versus the neuro fourplex A uh, from Quanterix. And those two assays do seem to uh, be very reliable uh, uh, for measuring NFL. Um, so that was reassuring that we could use either the single or the neuro fourplex and, and obtain similar results. Uh, so we, uh, the, the San Antonio team are looking at interplate and fasting versus non-fasting um, uh, measurements on this, but the clinical validation uh, using both prospective and legacy data is um, currently underway. The next one is the endothelial derived exosome inflammation kit. This is Fanny Allahi at UCSF. And um, so uh, what uh, happens with this kit is that uh, plasma, uh, sorry, platelet poor plasma is collected uh, from the participants. And that is then used for the isolation of uh, the endothelial uh, derived exosomes. And, um, and, then, uh, and then those exosomes can be used to measure um, you know, any protein. In this case, uh, this kit is measuring uh, C3B, complement component C3B, and also uh, C1Q. Uh, so endothelial, uh, the hypothesis endothelial derived exosomal uh, complement cargo reflect an, an innate immune inflammation in the endothelial cells. Uh, and so uh, what uh, UCSF, uh, the UCSF team have observed is that uh, increasing uh, endothelial derived um, C3B is associated uh, with higher systolic blood pressure. And also then um, higher C3B is associated with a lower executive function score. So, um, so the goal here is uh, to use this as a diagnostic classification and also stratification potentially into uh, anti-inflammatory clinical trials. So uh, this has been, you know, probably the most challenging kit with respect to cross-site validation, simply because the isolation of, of exosomes is not a trivial method. Uh, but what you can see is, um, is uh, encouragingly now uh, across sites uh, measuring uh, the endothelial derived C3B um, has been actually uh, quite reliable um, uh, with uh, achieving uh, ICCs uh, in the 0.8 range. So still uh, meeting the cutoff, uh, which was 0.7 um, was the original uh, lower limit for us to accept the instrumental validation. And then uh, uh, they, uh, so Fanny has found that plasma volume matters. So uh, if you have normal volumes across repeated experiments, it's quite stable, but uh, with small volumes, uh, you do get higher variability. 
The next kit is the plasma endothelial signaling kit. So this is a kit that measures three different angiogenic proteins in the plasma. This is using the MSD, Mesoscale Discoveries uh, Angiogenesis uh, Panel uh, 1 or panel A, I believe it is. So uh, we look at BFGF, uh, PLGF and VEGFD in the blood. And um, the, uh, the science here is that uh, this, uh, we know that these, uh, these proteins are all proangiogenic and the signaling um, of these molecules drives proliferation and migration of endothelial cells. Uh, but we don't really understand what these things are doing specifically on the cerebral endothelial cells. Um, but there is a strong effect of the composite of these three angiogenic proteins on the decline in executive function. And so what you see here is as the composite score for these three angiogenic proteins increases, executive functioning uh, actually decreases uh, over time. And this kit uh, has achieved its instrumental validation. Uh, and again, biologic validation is, is ongoing. Uh, the next kit is at CSF uh, PLGF. This is placental growth factor. Um, as uh, you may recall, in the last kit, it was one of those three angiogenic proteins as well. So uh, PLGF is definitely an interesting molecule. Uh, the reason we wanted to uh, validate this in the spinal fluid is that uh, CSFA, beta, and tau are already established for marking AD pathology. NFL is a marker of neurodegeneration. And so uh, we thought from a single CSF uh, uh, sample, you would be able to add the V to the ATN. Um, we have found uh, that PLGF has a strong relationship with cerebrovascular disease, and that's both in the UK cohort and the UCSF cohort. Um, and uh, we, uh, the, the premise for this kit was that uh, any trial, whether it's for small vessel disease or for AD, not only requires confirmation that the targeted pathology is present, but also as much as we can, uh, we can minimize uh, comorbidities. And so this is, uh, this is the data from our, um, from our cohort showing that with increased white matter hyperintensity volume by imaging, we have increased uh, PLGF in the CSF. Um, instrumental validation is complete. So uh, University of New Mexico, uh, UK and uh, UT San Antonio um, all uh, performed IC, uh, performed um, uh, uh, cross-site validation uh, on uh, 10 different CSF samples. We pre-specified an ICC of 0.8 as being acceptable and we achieved a 0.94 ICC across all three sites. So uh, the instrumental validation was uh, successful. Biologic validation is ongoing. And uh, since we were really wondering and scratching our heads where the PLGF might be coming from, uh, given its name, uh, we just did a study in our autopsy cohort at UK uh, and found that uh, PLGF is uh, significantly expressed in the brains of individuals with small vessel disease. Uh, uh, these same participants, when we went back and looked at their banked blood, they did have significant elevations in their PLGF. Uh, gene expression was increased uh, for PLGF and for VEGFD, which was another component of that endothelial signaling kit that I mentioned. Um, and you can see that the brain protein expression was increased. So uh, PLGF does seem to be having some, um, some brain uh, effects and, and increase in brain expression as well as what we're seeing in, in CSF and plasma. Uh, so just to summarize then, all of the kits at this point have been instrumentally validated. Biological validation is underway for almost all of the kits. And um, some of these kits uh, may be biologically uh, validated by the end of summer, we hope. Uh, Mark VCID 2 uh, is set to begin in the fall of 2021. And uh, this is a competitive uh, UO1 application. Uh, the, the proposals review at the end of June. Uh, so uh, depending on those outcomes, uh, uh, Mark VCID will, will continue in some form um, after fall of this year. So with that, um, I'm happy to take questions either now or, or during the discussion period. Uh, I'll let Hannah let me know what she'd rather do. I'm 
Okay, Thanks there's two questions. Everyone. Thanks, Donna, for your presentation on Mark and VCID. There are two questions that I'll let you go ahead and um, answer now if you see them okay. from Adam. Yeah. I got them. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. So uh, Adam says amazing accomplishments in the Mark VCID program. When you reported into site agreement for both imaging and fluid biomarkers, how was that established? The same participants traveled to multiple sites for scanning and blood draw. So uh, no, um, each. Uh, so for much of many of the imaging kits, it was the same images. So the, the inter-rater reliability was achieved by using the same images at different sites. We did have some participants uh, that did travel to different sites and underwent imaging. Um, so that was another method that was used for some of the imaging, um, some of the imaging uh, uh, kits. Uh, for the fluid kits, obviously, it's it's much easier to uh, take different aliquots of those samples and ship them to different sites. So that that is what we did with with the fluid kits. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, it was a, a variety of of methods to get into rater and and into site uh, reliability on that imaging. Uh, the second question um, in the plasma endothelial assay, what was the method used to purify the exosomes? That would be a question for uh, uh, Dr. Alahi, and I am not sure if if she is on. Uh, doesn't look like it. Um, so yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, you may want to uh, drop Fanny a, an email um, or, or I can pull up the methods while we're in this uh, during this next talk and, and get back to you. I don't recall exactly what that was. Okay, thanks everyone. Okay, thanks everyone for coming to the biomarker session. Thank you to Tatiana and Jeff on uh, uh, sharing uh, the updates for NICRAD. And uh, thank you to Donna for sharing the updates for Mark BCID. Can everyone see my screen? Not any longer, Cerise, now it's gone. Okay, I'm gonna do yeah, it a different way. sharing again. You can see my Big Bang Theory set. All right. Let's... Now we can. <clears throat> okay, so a few announcements for the biomarker course. We're gonna have a fall meeting. Um, we're gonna organize it through NAC on Wednesday, November 3rd. Um, we're gonna do it from 11 to 3 p.m. It's gonna be virtual, so save the date. Um, and we're gonna follow up on the conversations that we start today and uh, make plans for uh, the future of the biomarker core. Um, at this time, we've, ha um, we've completed uh, our announcements for the third cycle of the um, Alzheimer's Disease Centers. So by the end of the year, every ADRC will have a biomarker core and we're gonna start having um, the biomarker cores come together. And again, um, as I was mentioning in the imaging core, how can we synergize together uh, the products that we have in the biomarker core to stimulate uh, collective data collection and taking that collective data and transforming uh, the field. So, in addition to that, what happens is that NAC will run an election for biomarker car leaders, and we will form a steering committee. Um, and again, we hope that through the steering committee, we will start formalizing collective ideas on behalf of the center network. So that election will be starting in January of 22. So if you're interested, uh, you have ideas, you want to, you know, you want to sh have this forum of the, uh, to share your opinions and you have, you have the magic thought for the way that we should move forward. Uh, you can nominate yourself to be um, on the election ballot for the steering committee. Um, I just also want to remind everyone that in the RFA, 
the RFA um, uh, requests that catalogs of available biomarkers and relevant data uh, be shared with NAC. And so that's now that everyone uh, by the end of the year will have a biomarker core and everyone will have a biomarker core leader. Um, it's time for us to kind of work on the catalogs of available biomarkers and the relevant data that we can share with NAC. And so this is why this section is called the uh, review inventory. So over the last um, few weeks, uh, we asked uh, for clarifications and improvement in um, your answers for table A7. Uh, table A7 was submitted within uh, your RPPRs, and we attempted to use this first pass as a way to gather inventory of all the biomarkers that are correct, uh, collected across the center program. So we started with neural imaging, and the thing with our neural imaging is that some centers have separate cores that are neural imaging. And then some have biomarker cores that ha have neuroimaging as a feature in addition to fluid imaging. We didn't foresee this complication, but it's a complication to keep everybody straight. But everyone has a biomarker core, and some centers have a neuroimaging core that's separate from the biomarker core. And some have biomarker cores that do imaging. So we kind of gotten that straight. And I'll show you the data. Um, on this table A7, we asked if your imaging core had, uh, was in addition to the biomarker core. We asked if you collected amyloid PET and tau and other PET and MRI. And we were hoping that it would be a yes, no um, answer. And I can clarify that for next year. It's a yes, no answer. And we also wanted um, every center to list all the ligands that they're using on their participants so that we have like a master list of all the ligands across the centers. Um, but in addition to amyloid and uh, tau, centers are using other PET markers and we wanted to have you list all the other PET markers so you get an inventory of what other ligands you're using. And um, so this was our first attempt at getting this information. And so you can see that everyone 100% collects MRI, which is expected. And uh, you see that two thirds of the centers have uh, a neuroimaging core that's in addition to the biomarker core. Uh, the majority of you collect amyloid PET and tau PET and about half of you use other PET ligands. So for amyloid, um, these are the ligands that were um, listed, photobetapen, photobetapir, uh, carbon, um, <laughs> Pittsburgh compound P, uh, PIB, um, and then uh, NAV 4694. Uh, the three tau PET ligands were listed here. And then there are other PET ligands being used among the program that mark inflammation, uh, vascular transport, and um, even neuroephrine transport. And so the questions kind of, you know, become, um, you know, like, um, are we scanning and looking for um, things that are innovative and useful for the field. And now we kind of have like this data set about neural imaging for that. The next section of the table A7 dealt with blood, participant blood and stool. And so um, these are all kind of um, the ones that were collected. Again, it was supposed to be like a yes, no answer that you collect uh, and store these um, parts from the uh, participant blood. Um, we have cell pellet, DNA, RNA, plasma, serum, and cell lines that you grow, and also stool. And we see that these categories are 
about less, they occur in less than half the centers. And so maybe these are the ones that are less useful. And then here we have the greater than 50% where the majority of the centers are collecting uh, DNA. Everyone has plasma and stores it. And half of the people have whole blood and half of people have some um, PBMCs. And so I think that is a good baseline to know, um, of, you know, how to augment our um, use of the majority of the blood and blood samples that we have um, from participants. Uh, the next section of the table A7 asked uh, about the blood analysis that you're doing, um, whether you're doing amyloid 42 or tau, total tau or p tau and apoE. And again, these were to be yes, no um, uh, answers. And we see that most everyone is doing the apoE genotyping, but the yes, no is about 50%. So about half of our program is quantitating the amyloid and tau features of blood. For CSF in the table, we asked yes, no, do you collect CSF and are you doing these analysis for amyloid and tau? And majority of you are uh, collecting CSF and your uh, evaluating for amyloid and tau. Uh, then the, the table A7 kind of wraps up about what kind of plasma analysis you're doing. Uh, uh, I listed the top four that we're seeing. So ELISA, Quanterix, Roche, and MassSpect. Yes, I'm aware there are other platforms that you may be using, and hopefully you could add them in the notes. We can do another survey and get like another collection of them, but these are the top four. Um, and, and if having the other platforms are helpful for the core leaders, that would be great. Um, so again, it was yes, no, you do, uh, uh, you use Eliza's and Quanterix and Roche, and yes, you do mass specs. The second part of this question, which didn't get answered by everyone is, okay, if you're doing Eliza, what targets are you measuring by Eliza? And what are you measuring by the Roche system? And what are you measuring by mass spec? Um, so we don't have complete information on all of the targets that everyone is producing across the center. So that um, could be something that we work on for our November meeting to just to have that data. Um, also, uh, there's a, not everyone answered this section about other biomarkers. So there is a wealth of other biomarkers that centers are focused on and we just don't have the complete data to share today. But I think as we improve this table A7 um, and, and we get more data uh, through your progress reports, I think that that would be helpful for us to understand the capacity of each of the biomarker cores and what we have available uh, to synergize across the network. Uh, so, these are kind of the yes no's uh, for those four platforms and we're kind of at 50% um, that half of the centers are kind of using um, these analysis. So um, the rest of the meeting is time for your questions and answers and your discussions. Um, Looking at this data that uh, you helped uh, collect and you provided in this short overview, how did the inventory improve your understanding of the biomarker landscape of the center network? And what immediate data collections can we maximize across the network to contribute to the understanding of the disease? And how can we start to prepare these biomarker catalogs and upload relevant data to NAP? Um, 
Uh, I think those are my three top questions for discussion. And again, we're kind of starting the discussion here in May and we would like to follow up um, with you know, more input from all of the core leaders um, since we don't have a steering committee yet and have a fuller conversation um, in October. Or what did I say? November, November, November. So um, the Q&A is up and um, available and you could, uh, I'll start looking at it and answering your questions. I'm also open to having you raise your hands and voice your discussion um, since we're here for um, another 45 minutes. So um, please provide feedback for Tatiana and Jeff and Donna on their presentations and also this overall discussion about biomarker cores. Okay, so Trey has wrote that it's important to keep in mind that other ligands may be collected by projects that use the ADRC resources but aren't collected or coordinated by the core. And the table language, you are correct, Trey, are, is about what is done in the center. And I think that that's kind of the other biomarker um, section that I was leaving available to uh, collect that data that other ligands are collected using the resources that you provide. So we could um, tighten that up and also include that and figure out that landscape across each center. Can I ask one question, Cerise? When I was looking at your survey results, and I wonder if this would also help the discussion too, um, like I thought about APOE in particular when you were flagging that. So only because we do calls with, we meaning NICRAD, let me be sure, let me make sure I know, I say who the we is. Um, we do a lot of calls and there's, <clears throat> there's actually very few centers still generating their own APOE genotyping almost. Again, nothing's absolute, but many of them do um, get that centrally. And so I wonder when they were completing this survey, if people are also reporting what they might be getting through, you know, they may not be generating it at their center, um, and so I did wonder a little bit about that because I think that would layer part of what I think you know Donna's talking about and what Jeff and I talked about, which is the idea of where possible trying to centralize so that you have uniformity, you have some ease in terms of being able to combine data on the same assay across many centers and across many studies um, and really being able to generate the kind of analyses we're looking at. So I, I do wonder, in, and I don't know if the rest of you thought that when you were when you were reading it, but I did sort of wonder in some cases is some of the assays potentially still being sent out. They may not be getting generated at, at the actual center, and that might actually make things easier for us in terms of com combining. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I have a Sterling kind of put a comment in the chat. Um, would the coordination between imaging core and biomarker and other relevant cores at these meetings so that there's cross communications and coordinated initiatives? And that's a definite yes. Um, I feel that, you know, our virtual um, sessions has kind of hamstring that coordination. Um, it's also like the additional of other people, the addition of other people and other groups and other opinions. And that always kind of makes it uh, complicated. But, um, you know, we are definitely kind of uh, working towards doing that um, cross uh, core uh, integration. I know, um, for a fact, like the data core wanted to be more involved um, uh, in other cores and they've been involved in the clinical task force and, and they've kind of listened in on other imaging meetings and they're trying to fit, um, you know, how the data analysis and data uh, management could help uh, all of the goals that each of the steering committees are kind of uh, talking, talking forward. Um, Let's see, Rhoda brought up that digital is not on the chart. Yes, I noticed this morning. Um, and again, it's kind of um, 
uh, one of those other biomarkers you could add in the other categories and we commodify the table uh, to, to work that out. Adam has a, a comment in the Q&A box that said, for the survey data, when you know that sites do each biomarker, does that mean the biomarkers are derived on clinical core, NAC, enrollees, or that ADR supports the research that implements those biomarkers? So those are definitely two important scenarios because it's, it's, um, it's a totally, uh, I think, for the purposes of the version one of table A7, it's definitely what you do in your participants. Um, but I think then the broader question as your biomarker core becomes a resource for uh, your institution or other R01s, um, that also kind of, you know, is like a secondary level of a question. So your point is taken, thanks. Um, Jennifer uh, from uh, UCSF asked, um, oh, thanks. I'm happy to be straightforward. You know, that's my skill, I, 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 people tell me. So um, our center had a couple of questions when you're working on the tables. We got many of those questions. We'll try to make the versions better. Should we only catalog active collection or should we include historical data sets? I mean, I mean, that's a question for each center. I feel at this point in time, um, as we're kind of gathering like the data that we have, we could start with active collections. And once we get like a, a, a landscape of what we're collecting or any kind of collaborations or goals for the future, we could go back and see if any of those historical data sets kind of fit into the goals and opportunities that the steering committee and the core leaders kind of follow. So I think it's better to limit it to active at that time. Um, what's the minimum N? I don't think I have a minimum N. Um, I think if you're doing these biomarker tests and you have the capability, I think we would want to know if you had that capability. And Hannah, I see that Charlie has his uh, hand up. Uh, uh, can you let him ask his question, please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I had a, a question um, that Tatiana kind of touched on, but uh, in, in a broader sense. So one of the things that we're doing in our biospecimens core, we're one of those ones that have two separate cores. Um, so, you know, our imaging core is working with scan and that's all running very nicely. I'm not sure we have the same kind of direction yet for the biospecimens core. And this relates to the fact that we're doing some O analysis on all our participants using the Neuroplex 4. So how do we do reliability? How is that going to be uploaded? What's the payment? You know, all these things that are getting super complicated very quickly. Um, and um, what do we get back or where, how do these get merged? And maybe I'm pr premature in this question. So I just wanted to get a, a more broad um, response from you, Cerise, about how the program uh, sees this and how NICRAD sees this, et cetera. Thanks, Charlie. Um, you know, I think it, it's, it's never premature because the question is always there. And so for every like a aspect, so um, right now, I think by doing this inventory, we're just kind of seeing the lay of the land and mm -hmm. um, we hope to leave it up to the biomarker core leaders to take okay. that inventory and determine like what, um, what is feasible and what is most helpful for the field. Um, and um, also, I mean, for us at NIA, I, we want to facilitate this catalog of this inventory and the, and the related data to NAC. So 
for us, that's like the most important part of um, coming together. Um, but we're gonna let like which data um, be kind of managed by the core leaders. So um, I think we have, you know, the whole future project period to kind of decide on um, the best way to move forward. Can I add a little bit? And I bet you Donna will have comments on this too. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll peg her first. So, so to me, this feels a little bit like where we were in the old days. Let's, let's go back to APOE and let's go back to GWAS. If I can start there. So it was something that we knew we wanted, um, didn't have it centralized. So some centers went and you know, developed APOE genotyping locally. Some centers went and sent their samples for GWAS. Some sent, you know, and then there ended up being some national resources where some samples got run you know, and, and we sort of crept our way toward it. I, I wouldn't say that we're necessarily in a different place right now. Some centers have moved very rapidly into, I'll just call them blood-based or, or even CSF-based um, biomarkers. They moved aggressively into it. It was a focus of their center. They have a lot set up in their center and they do it very well and they use it for other studies. I think there are some centers that tread more slowly. Maybe they're either sending samples away or they haven't figured out what they want to do yet. And so I think, um, and I think sort of Don and I both covered that. There is no one global solution that's gonna cover biomarkers for everybody. Um, that just, that's not where the field is. We all have specific research needs. I think what we want to as best we can, and it's not an absolute, is have it sort of the back end. We can combine data sets as, as best we can so that we can generate the largest sample sizes that will allow us to test a wide variety of questions allow us to address questions, for example, of diversity, health disparities, look at you know, various potential on um, whether social determinants of health or a variety of effects and potentially how they interact with biomarkers. And especially in order to do that, I think you wanna be able to, at the back end, combine as many data sets, hopefully as possible. And so I think what a lot of what we're doing is trying to align tools, whether it's samples that are used in reference, whether it's crosstalk across assays, trying to figure out how we're going to be able to do that. It's the same place where, of course, the imaging, you know, the brain imaging field has been as well. We're all sort of struggling with that. And I think we're trying to let science continue to progress, know that centers have priorities. I mean, I know Charlie's center as well. You, you've been working in these fields for a long time. You're not about to change how you're doing this, and no one's asking you to. But I do think we're trying to figure out how at the back end we're going to be able to combine as much data as possible and put it somewhere centrally. And I think that's in part sort of what Cerise gathered with her tables is you've got stuff being collected. We're gonna figure out like, is it all going to the same place? You're actually doing it here at your own center. We're gonna figure all that out as we sort of dive into this. But I think we're just trying to see what can we collect in common so that we can address larger questions and be able to combine data. I actually think that's sort of the fundamental thing we're trying to get to. Um, and, I, and I'll stop there and then let others address. But I, I just wanted to kind of frame it because I think that's really in essence what you're asking. Although I could be totally wrong, Charlie, and I know you'll tell me if I am. And also like, um, you know, since we have like this long Q&A period, I'm open to people raising their hand and voicing their questions to the panelists, so. Oh, uh, this is Charlie. I just wanted to respond to talk to you. I, I think where you're going is great. Uh, and again, I think this is the stuff that the, uh, the committee will have to address. Um, uh, and I agree that the more we can put up there, but there, the better it will be. I just think there are there are a few details that have to get worked out, and that's that was my only point. Um, but you're you're absolutely right. I like where this is going. Yeah, and just to follow on a little bit from Tatiana and and from Charlie, you know, um, I think best practices is so important when it comes to fluid collection. Um, you know, processing. Someone asked about heparin earlier. I mean, we've done some comparisons from the same participants on heparin prepared versus EDTA prepared plasma and uh, they are not comparable <laughs> is, is you know what we found uh, from from most analytes you can't interchange you know heparin and EDTA but also you know storage time and tube type and the amount of space in the tube right so what tube and what aliquot size you have I think 
are important. Um, the GBSC, so the Global Biomarker Standardization Consortium has been looking at a lot of this stuff in great detail. And I've been pleasantly surprised at how stable things are. I think uh, Tatiana's nodding too. You know, the last time I saw some of this data, you know, I was very impressed with how, you know, if they sit for eight hours versus, you know, two hours and, um, you know, if they're stored for this many weeks and this many weeks. So it looks pretty, they look more stable than I, than I thought. I thought we'd, we'd really struggle with these things, but, um, it, you know, I think the sample preparation is important. What we're finding in Mark VCID, like I just showed, the, the cross-site reliability of these instruments. So most of the measures are being done on Quanterix. Uh, in Mark VCID, uh, one of the kits is, is using MSD. Um, the cross-site reliability has been really good. So there, I think there is a potential to have, you know, sites that have their own instruments and, and, and provided they're following the same protocols and using best practices for sample collection. You know, I think the sharing of that data is feasible. I was also going to flag, so there's a, a commentary between Alan and Jennifer, also um, Alan Levy and Jennifer Yohana on the, in the chat around um, having some uh, large plasma pools. I, I think that's the same thing we were, we were sort of describing earlier. Um, Jeff had covered that. It's something we do in NICRA, but I think we're talking about kind of making that on a very large scale. And again, that would just help, you know, on the back end, being able to, if centers are running their own, you know, plasma, that's great. That's, you know, that, we don't want to interfere with that. Can we include some samples that allow that combination in the back end so we can combine data across all the ADRCs? I, I think that's frequently used, and I think we're all sort of advocating for resources like that that will just make sure we can combine it the back end. Um, the, the last comment I kind of have in the QA box. So if you got more questions or more thoughts, um, send them our way. Trey says that, you know, plasma biomarkers are advancing and um, we all have limited resources in the platforms. And then um, one goal might be used to use the plasma as a guide uh, for selection of cases for imaging um, and, and describe the turnaround time for um, the, NAC, the NICRAD assays doesn't seem to, uh, to meet that. So uh, uh, Jeff or Tatiana, yeah. do you have? Yeah, so, so actually we had a little sidebar um, going on. I, I will admit, I, I, I don't think it was during your, your talks, Therese, no, no, no insult. So we were just sort of thinking to ourselves, how do we get a sense of sort of the variability of how people are thinking about using, um, if they were to get centralized plasma you know, biomarkers? And, and I think Donna, you know, I think getting general information on this would be incredibly helpful. So we actually just sort of tinkered around and got um, Kelly Faber to agree. We'd be glad to put up a red cap that we could distribute a link to. Not today. It might take us a day, to, day or two to think about what we want to ask. But we'd actually like to gauge how do people plan to use that? Are you thinking about doing it, for example, in a study where you want to do regular analysis? We're trying to get a feel for how many investigators are really thinking about doing this in a more rapid turnaround process where it could inform enrollment or other decisions. I just want to remind everyone this is not clear. This is research grade on testing. So we just want to make sure we don't get that mixed up. But we sort of talked on the side, you know, by email and said, you know, if we knew there's a certain group of samples where that turnaround was needed, that's the kind of thing we, we haven't got this all set up. And so it would be very possible to set it up. So part of the capacity was on a more rapid turnaround, you know, for those studies where that's needed. So I think we're really open. We would just like to gauge the scope and the proportion of that interest. So I'll just put out that I think we're going to get a little red cap ready and send it out to all the participants and we'd really like to hear from you. And, and I, would you agree, Donna? I think that would be actually helpful in general for a number of studies to get more of a feel of where people are going with this. Yeah, I think, um, I, you know, I, I think uh, people's use of the biomarker data is going to be really important. I mean, we uh, at UK, you know, we've been using them for several, you know, things and and we're about to, you know, use them to look at, you know, inclusion, exclusion for, for a study. And, and there you do want rapid turnaround. Other times, you know, we're using them in clinical pathological consensus meetings. You know, you can, you've got time to prepare for those things. So, yeah, it would be really helpful to hear how, um, how the different sites would like to use this fluid data. And maybe there are two 
you know, two paths. You can have a, you, you know, it's like applying for a passport, right? You can, you can have an expedited path because you need it for one study, or you can just have it in the standard path because you don't need it right away. I think it's, and I think that's actually really exciting, to, you know, to, yeah. to get a sense of, of sort of the scale at which this be done. So um, that's sort of an outcome from us that we're, we're going to get that sent out. And we might partner with a couple of studies and try to make sure we, we ask the questions in a way that it helps the broadest number of people complaining. Hello. So uh, we have no more questions in the box or any conversation in the chat. Um, I just want to thank uh, uh, Jeff and Tatiana and Donna for uh, being part of the conversation and sharing um, all of the work that they've done. Um, I just want to highlight that, um, you know, this is kind of like an introductory kind of meeting to the discussion of, you know, what to do about biomarkers. And um, the announcement was that we're going to plan for a fall biomarker meeting in um, November 3rd. And um, if you have, uh, I'm, I'm going to organize it through the biomarker uh, listserv for all the core leaders. Um, and you have input about the agenda. Um, I'm open to your comments. So my inbox is open um, for you. Please email me. Um, and probably starting in June, I will start organizing your ideas and um, come up with an agenda for the meeting. And also, if you kind of seen our landscape about, um, you know, you've, you've seen our landscape uh, with the inventory and you have, um, you know, uh, an idea or a way forward and you want to volunteer for the election, um, please look out in January for when NAC will be running the Biomarker Steering Committee um, election. And um, if you have any questions, uh, you could please, you know, you can email me and I will go ahead and let this session go. Um, if there is a question from Rhea Carrillo. I don't know if you wanna, if you wanna address that, if you saw that, Cerise, are you? I just saw it now. And I will make uh, Maria's uh, comment, the last comment. Um, uh, she stated that she heard uh, Sterling say there wasn't sufficient dollars to do all the markers of interest. And uh, Tatiana says that there's different sites that have different needs depending on the science. So all, not all will be the same. And her question is to whether there's a need for more money and um, to do biomarkers. And um, that's the kind of point of having a biomarker inventory um, to have the plan uh, to understand what the, what the landscape of the center network can provide and what plan forward would the biomarker core leaders like to um, uh, assess and, and, and plan for resources. So um, we're always, um, we're open to sharing and we're open to the discussion and the conversation. So thanks for your comment, Maria. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Great job, everyone.